Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In the impromptu speech that Alcibiades delivers at the very end of the symposium, in a drunken state, one of the key themes has to do with Socrates, and it, it, it turns on a metaphor about this, what we're going to talk about, the Selenus statue. The real contrast that's going on there is between inside and outside, or the internal and the external, the private, the real, and the public, the only apparent. And Alcibiades is going to say that Socrates has a particularly complex relationship between these, uh, which he himself has been able to come to know firsthand, and he's going to tell us about it. So he says Socrates is like those Selenus statues, and if you've ever seen an image of Socrates, you, you can see that he not only is a pretty ugly guy, he's pretty ugly in a rather specific way. Selenus was a satyr. He's one of these, you know, legendary uh, half-man, half-beast half kind of creatures, and he's kind of an ugly-looking thing, right? And he, he represents the forces of nature or the old gods or, you know, there's all, the verdict's kind of out on it. There's, or rather, there's too many different verdicts on that. And he says Socrates looks like one of those things, but uh, in Athens, the, these statues that they had were kind of tricky because on the outside, they would look rather plain and, and common and ugly, but when you would open them up, they had little images, golden images, of the gods, of the beautiful Greek gods inside. So the metaphor here is that Socrates himself is, he's got this external appearance, uh, what it is that people think about him as a public figure, but none of that's really the case. That's all just sort of for show, and inside is where the real action is because there's beautiful, wonderful things, but you've got to open him up first before you can see that sort of thing. So how is Socrates like this? Um, Alcibiades doesn't fully develop the metaphor, you know, perhaps because he's drunk, because you know that's the way Plato intends him to be in this case. But you know, drunkenness is probably a metaphor for Alcibiades' intemperance and impatience anyway. He does develop several of the, we might say, shared attributes that are making this metaphor work. One of these is that Selenus was supposed to have been a musician. And like musicians, he would stir up the soul. He would charm or soothe or arouse or, you know, all sorts of other action words we could say, the souls of those who are listening to the music. Now, Selenus would play a flute. Um, there were other musical instruments that were used, and then, of course, there's the voice. And there's this entire tradition in Greece of epic poetry, which was not just recited, but actually sung as well. So there's this entire musical tradition to draw upon. And music, we know, stirs the person up. We see this in Plato's other dialogues uh, quite a bit. It was a commonplace among the Greeks. Socrates is a musician. But Socrates, unlike other musicians, doesn't need an instrument. As a matter of fact, his voice is not even an instrument in the way that other musicians are, where they sing, and there's tones in, in the voice. Socrates just needs words. And with those words, Socrates can totally captivate an audience. He can perplex them. He can enthrall them. He can, you know, leave them desiring more. He often does leave them desiring more. Um, he can make them totally, you know, confused. He can illuminate them. So Socrates is like Selenus in that he's, he's got that going for him. 
Another way in which he's very much like Selenus, according to Alcibiades, has to do with what we call Socratic irony. And irony doesn't mean the kind of irony that we talk about today when we say, oh, that's ironic that, you know, when, say, poetic justice happens, right? The person who is committing the crime gets robbed himself. Um, we call that ironic. Um, the, the, the Greeks actually called that by, by another name um, that you know, Aristotle talks about as reciprocity. Uh, you know, literally, the, the, the same thing being done in return to you. Socratic irony is a different sense of irony where you're saying something and it doesn't quite mean what you're saying. There's more uh, than lies beneath, there's more beneath the surface than is there, you know, right up front in the appearances. So Socratic irony exhibits this dialectic between the internal, which it takes work to get to, and the external. And so Socrates outwardly will talk about all sorts of crazy stuff like cobblers and, you know, fishermen and pick whatever you like, you know, horseshoes and but inside, if you look at his words, there's a lot of, at least it seems like, wisdom there. At the same time, Socrates himself externally is professing that he does not possess wisdom or knowledge. Now, all that it takes is, is reading a Platonic dialogue rather closely, and you will see that there's a lot of places in the dialogue where Socrates won't be saying that he doesn't know anything, or that you know, they haven't arrived at any sort of conclusions because you'll be making use of all sorts of principles that people agree to along the way. And he'll also lead them along. How is this possible, somebody like Alcibiades says, if this guy doesn't truly possess any knowledge or wisdom? How does he know where the discussion is going? How does he know how to lead people if he himself doesn't already know the destination? Does Socrates really possess that, that wisdom or knowledge? Alcibiades doesn't know, but he suspects that Socrates is concealing more than he's actually laying out there, revealing, showing to, to his audience, including Alcibiades. So again, like the, the statues, open them up, there's more inside. Not only Socrates himself, but his Socrates' own words can be opened up to find another level, another deeper meaning within them. There's another way in which uh, Socrates is like those statues, in which there's a difference between the inside and the outside, as well, uh, ugliness and beauty. And this has to do with the virtues. And here's where Alcibiades' speech starts to go a little bit off the rails, right? He's going to talk about temperance. That comes up primarily in terms of the seduction story that I talk about in the other core concept video on the Alcibiades speech, where uh, Alcibiades pulls out all the stops. He wants to seduce Socrates. He wants Socrates, who in fact does appreciate his charms, to become his lover in a very carnal sense. And he, you know, goes the whole way and is unable to pull it off. Very much like the old, you know, um, uh, sort of silly, you know, scenario where the student comes into the professor's office and says, you know, I want to talk with you about my grade. I'll do anything, anything whatsoever. And then, you know, they start taking off some of their clothes. Alcibiades goes even further than that. He gets naked and lays down next to Socrates and tells Socrates, you're the only person that's worthy of my love, the only person that, that really deserves me to give myself to you. And Socrates says, We'll have to consider that sometime. And then when he wakes up the next morning, he says it's as if, you know, nothing had happened uh, because nothing did happen. So Socrates can display not only temperance of a normal sort, but temperance that goes above and beyond. He is the paragon of temperance itself, of moderation, of a control over the bodily appetites for physical pleasures. Courage. Uh, Alcibiades tells this wonderful story about several different occasions where he and Socrates were on military service together, which is something that you had to do as a man of, of a, a Greek city-state if you were a citizen. You had to be ready to go to war. Socrates actually saves Alcibiades at one point, and here's again where the internal and external come out. Socrates should have been given the decoration 
for valor. Instead, they decided to award it to Alcibiades, who's the one who got into the, 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 the problem and who had to be saved by Socrates. They give it to Alcibiades because they see him as a rising general and he has family connections. And so the public and the private, there's a discrepancy between the two. And Alcibiades is bringing this up. He's saying Socrates is totally courageous. Now, what about the other virtues, the other cardinal virtues? And here's where the speech gets, gets you know, much more fragmented. Um, we've already talked about wisdom in terms of Socratic irony. Is there a wisdom there? Alcibiades isn't quite sure. He thinks that there is. Um, what about justice, though? The fourth of the traditional four virtues, the cardinal virtues. Alcibiades actually seems to suggest that Socrates himself is unjust, at least in respect to Alcibiades, because he talks about Socrates as mistreating him and mistreating so many other young men uh, who Socrates gives attention to, and then these young men you know, end up, instead of being the desired ones, end up being the desirers and you know, getting, into, getting themselves into all sorts of fits over Socrates. He's saying Socrates is abusing them. Now the question that we should ask is, is Socrates really treating them unjustly, or is Socrates treating them exactly the way that they deserve? He's being temperate in his relations to them. He is offering them a chance to, by engaging with him, uh, have some sort of connection towards wisdom. He is exhorting them to live the better life. It actually appears uh, from Alcibiades' own words that Socrates is one of the few beneficial influences on him it's too bad that it didn't really work out with Socrates being able to change Alcibiades' character for the better, because he could have been an incredible asset for his city. Um, so probably Socrates, if we read between the lines, truly does possess justice. But all of that is only apparent if we look at you know, something within, if we don't just look at appearances. Uh, if we look at just the appearances, we see the ugly. If we look at the reality, that is much more compelling and is worthwhile, we see Socrates as beautiful. 